Oh, that's good. That's what I say. Yeah. Believe in me and got it. I say got it, I guess. No. <laughs> Got it. I got it. Mm -hmm. There we go. Oh man, you guys look so great here on Facebook Live. I'm enjoying it. There we go. All right, Facebook Live, keep coming in. I see you guys coming in. Thank you all for the support. And uh, we're going to give it a couple of minutes, and then we're going to start this, uh, this wonderful discussion with our, our guests. So um, looking forward. We're going to give it a couple of minutes, but I see you guys coming in. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, they keep coming in. So we're going to give it a couple more minutes and then we're going to get started. But it seemed like a lot of people are jumping in on this one. So, well, they are excited to see you all. I think that's what it is. <laughs> I got my uncle, Clinton, and OJ. OJ said, what's up? He's watching. OJ Love. OJ Love. Yeah, I see OJ Love. OJ Love is on the Facebook Live. What's up, OJ? <laughs> All right. I saw OJ at the SWAC Championship. He act like he didn't want to speak to me, I, but I wasn't going to act. I was going to be professional, you know. Mm-hmm. That's that circle again from, mm -hmm. from Bel Air, OJ Love. Bel Air, baby. <laughs> he gave you a hand clap. All right, welcome to another vibe session with J Dub. Uh, I'm your host, Jay Dub, and uh, today we got a, a August panel. Uh, man, I, I had to, I didn't have to search far for these two, but they are some, some very uh, established, and I am so excited to uh, talk to these individuals. I couldn't wait for, for this one. I think it's a great uh, duo, and today we're going to be talking about leadership and uh, you know, leadership and transition at leadership above and beyond. And today we have one of our guests, Lori Jackson Evans, how are you? Welcome, former Miss JSU, 1998 to 1999, is that correct? She has served with Jackson State for about 15 years. She currently is in Memphis, and she uh, was past president of Alumni Association and now sit on the Southeast Board. Uh, 
of alumni. And also we have Mr. Ira Vaughn. He is no stranger to Jackson State in Jackson, Mississippi, one of our former head drum major of the Sonic Boom of the South and who I deem godfather of, of drum majors. So we're gonna have some great discussion on leadership, characteristics, um, empowerment, encouragement, mentorship, visions. We're gonna talk about a lot of stuff uh, as it pertains to leadership. So let's jump in it and we got some good people here. And if you guys like what we're doing, go ahead and hit the like button. I also have J-Dub's Corner uh, Facebook page. So go ahead and um, tune in or follow me on J-Dub's Corner. But most importantly, if you have any questions or if you like what we're doing, uh, submit some questions, submit, you know, like this, share it, um, and let's have fun with it. So I thank you all for the support. J Dub's Corners. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do is uh, create a movement of like minded individuals that want to be purposeful in their life. Uh, the journey is challenging, but what I would like to do is bring ordinary people that are doing extraordinary things in life and um, that will help you on your journey to a more purposeful life. So, thank you all. Uh, Angie, thank you. She says, hello, Lori, Angie Price. So wave to her. So let's get into it. So basically, we all went to Jackson State. We're a product of JPS. Let me ask you all this. What is it about leadership and the characteristics that you guys were taught from an undergrad standpoint? and where you are right now, your journey above and beyond, how did your leadership understanding what it looks like, um, how it was manifested, and how are you actually utilizing that in your world as today? So Laura, since you are the Miss JSU female, let's ask you, let's go ahead and jump into it. First of all, introduce yourself and then let's go ahead and answer that question. Sure. So thank you so much for the invitation to uh, participate tonight. I'm really excited about the conversation and also uh, being in the midst of two great drum major, head drum majors, Jackson State, I call them knees. Um, <laughs> but I am I am Laura Jackson Evans. I am a uh, native Jacksonian. So um I'm originally, I've been in Memphis now for eight years, but I'm originally from Jackson, Jackson, Mississippi, graduated from Murrah High School. Murrah. And um, Murrah, that's right, Murrah, woo, -woo. <laughs> um, But anyway, I um, attended Jackson State 95 through 99, and my senior year, I reigned as Miss Jackson State University. Um, but also leading up to that, I also um, served as, uh, was in the president's cabinet, the SJ president's cabinet as a freshman. I was the only freshman to serve. Um, in the president's SJ president's cabinet, and those positions were normally reserved for juniors and seniors, but I was the director of community service. Uh, my sophomore year, I was elected Miss Sophomore Class 1996-97. Um, my junior year, I served as junior class vice president. And of course, my senior year, I reigned as Miss Jackson State. Um, I think for me, um, you know, just being engulfed into all things Jackson State University, when I when I when I hit the campus. Uh, well, let me be clear. I, I didn't want to go to Jackson State, right? Because Jackson State was in Jackson. It was almost like the 14th or the 13th grade for us, right? Because, you know, growing up, you would go out, go to the football games and, you know, you would see friends and family. And, you know, my parents went to Jackson State. That's where they met was at Jackson State. Um, so I wanted to go anywhere else but Jackson State. But at the end of, at the, end of the day, my dad told me somebody is going to be going to Jackson State University. And it's probably going to be you. And I was like, okay, you know, I want to go somewhere else. But anyway, but Jackson being there afforded me so many opportunities. And um, one was to just really develop my leadership and who I who I am today, who I was then, um, and just ha allowed me an opportunity to um, make a significant impact on the lives of others, but also other people before me made a significant impact on my life. Um, mm -hmm. And I was afforded an opportunity to just uh, flourish and, and, and really just learn about me, the likes, my likes, my dislikes, 
um, how, how I ebb and flow, um, you know, how I want to operate, what I want to be, where I want to go. And I think me being at not only just HBCU, but specifically Jackson State gave me uh, that, that, um, that, that breeding ground um, to be, to really hone in on my leadership skills so that I could uh, be where I am today and, um, and be successful um, in the various roles that I've had, both personally and professionally. So um, I, I, I hope that answered your question, but um, yeah, yeah. it just, you know, I, 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 owe, I owe a lot of who I am today to just being at Jackson State University and the people that I met um, and then the people that I had opportunity to interact with um, there and, and also um, beyond um, my college wall, so. Thank you, Ms. Lori. Ira, introduce yourself, mister. Well, James, thanks. Thank you for um, choosing me to be on your, your podcast. Um, there's millions of people you could have chose, but I did. I am a Callaway graduate, 1986. Um, I attended JSU in 1986 through 1990. When um, I was like Lord, I did not choose Jackson State first. I actually went to Southern University in Baton Rouge, um, came back home after Dow, actually before Dow Taylor telling him that I was gonna go to Southern, he told me to sign my scholarship. He said, uh, you'll be back. And not knowing what he knew, he, uh, after I got back to Jackson State, he told me, he said, I knew you will be back son because I know how you were raised. He said, I know what you, wh where, your, where your family came from and all that. And I knew that you wasn't gonna stay down there for what you were about to get into. But I am back at Jackson State finishing up my degree. Um, I am a senior studying interdisciplinary studies. Um, I have had plenty of opportunity to uh, show that leadership that I got the opportunity to actually practice um, for years. And now I'm actually in a position where I do that job on a regular. Um, one of the biggest things is <clears throat> leaving Jackson gave me an opportunity when I was living in Memphis also. Uh, I stayed in Memphis about 15, 15 years, um, moved to Miami, stayed there for a little bit over two years, went to St. Louis, got an opportunity to live there in a full circle, and I ended up back home. And I've been back in Jackson for about 18 years, and I've been in the restaurant business going on now a little bit over 20 years. and it's given me the opportunity to see our young people and every opportunity that I give them. And I, I have a little spiel that I give them. I say, I don't mind giving your job. It's up to you to keep. It. And the great thing about that is, you know, I get an opportunity to, to mentor every employee that I employ into my business. So, um, and, and it's, it's been a nice roller coaster. Uh, I tell everyone I'm on my third group of 18 year olds. So, um, and this group right here is one of the most challenging groups because of uh, things just, things are just getting, they're different. And um, I think that my goal is to try to empower them so right. they don't think everything is instant. Um, the social media is really impacting um, the leadership um, and it's given them more, it's given the leaders that's trying to teach and mentor these young, young ones that nothing is instant. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a challenge, James. And I think that uh, an open forum as this will help some, but I think mentorship is really, is really um, more evident and more precious now than ever. Uh, because we have to be able to touch these young folks now. Um, right. So, yeah. You know what, Ira, you, you make a great point. And let's have fun with this. Let's go ahead and vibe in J-Dub's corner. I believe that every person inherently has leadership ability. But I think our culture um, pretty much would not allow us to discover that gifted or that leadership ability. 
In fact, most people would die as a follower, not a leader. So if you know that we have an innate leadership characteristic and don't see it manifest, you know, why, where did you find yourself or how can colleges like Jackson State University or being in a position that you guys are in right now help young people manifest their leadership and become who they supposed to become and be purposeful? And what are you guys are doing to help lead that charge that people, young people, like you said, our that come into your facility and Lori, how you're touching and encouraging and mentoring people that they're able to understand their gift, their leadership ability and manifest it before it's too late. Laura, I'm going to let you talk first. Well, I mean, um, so again, you mentioned that I worked at Jackson State for 15 years and I worked in the area of student affairs. And so I had uh, various roles, um, you know, associate director for campus life, uh, coordinator of student organizations, SGA advisor, you know, assistant director for Greek affairs, all touching students, all touching lives, right? And for me, it was um, it was funny because a lot of times the students would always say, and I actually see, um, I have a funny story to tell you. So Karamo Kani, when I first started working at Jackson State, Karamo was, uh, he was, you know, he was, that's when he was, you know, learning, he, well, I ain't gonna say learning, he was newly into the DJ world, right? I remember he was gonna have, he was gonna have this party. He was green. And I was like, hmm? He was green. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, was, he was very green, he was very green. Yeah, he was very green. And, uh, and I remember I didn't know who he was. And so, um, and I, I guess I looked young enough for, to be a student, you know. And so he walked in the SJ office and, and they were trying to have his party. And I was like, we can't do that. And see, you know, my boss was telling me, no, they can't do this and stuff like that. So he walks in and he probably didn't remember this, but he was talking to this student and he was just like, well, who is this lady? And she won't let us do this and da, 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 da. And I was like, well, who was the lady? He said, her name is uh, Miss Jackson or something like that. I said, well, that would be me. And I think we instantly kind of bonded, you know, after we had to get through the, you know, had to get through the rough patch, mm -hmm. but we, we bonded after that. We, you know, we, we just, we're down like four flat tires now, but I was never the yes person. And I had, but I had to learn that. And this is one thing that I told my boss and I had to learn this as a young professional. When I first started working, I wanted to be liked. Okay. And, and it was because I came in the middle of the year um, because if the person, my predecessor had left like two, literally two weeks before homecoming was about to happen. And they needed to, they needed somebody to carry out homecoming. So I went to the vice president. I said, hey, I can step in to do this. I did it as a student. But the students were so used to their own ways and the things that they were doing. Here comes this new person trying to break the mold and, and, and you know, change up things, right? So I got this reputation of being this dragon. And this dragon is sat on the third floor and, you know, she would just breathe out fire and all that kind of stuff. But... I, I, then I started trying to acquiesce who I was and trying to give into the students to give them what they wanted. And it all, it didn't, and it always didn't work out for me as the employee. Mm -hmm. And then I said to myself, after about two years of doing that, I said, no, you know what? I don't want to be liked. I want to be respected. And what I told my vice president one time, we were talking and I said, and I would just listen sometimes to the students and the conversation they were having about him sometimes. And I said, you know what? Um, I want to be respected, not liked. I could care less if these students like me or not. Because what I have come to know is that a lot of the administrators around here that are liked, they're not respected. But a lot of the ones that are respected, they may not be liked. But I think for me, that is proven time and time again because so many of the students that I interacted with during their undergraduate you know, days, we, we, we have the strongest relationships and bonds to this day. And, it, and, it, and again, anything that, it's like a diamond. A diamond that you get, they say diamond in a rough. The diamond, the finished product is not what you see from the beginning. You know, you have to, you have to work, you know, work towards, you know, molding and shaping and, uh, you know, chiseling that, that diamond to be the beautiful um, edifice that it is when you, when you put it on a, a finger or your earrings, or your necklace or whatever. And so I, then I just adopted that as my motto. I don't want to be liked. I want to be respected. And I think the students started learning that about me. But here's the thing. I would tell you no. I'm not gonna always tell you yes, but I'm gonna tell you no, but I'm gonna also give you a route to get back to your yes. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and it was a it was a two edged sword for me because I was also I was an employee, yes, but I was also an alum. And there were times when I knew there were things that were coming down the pipeline I couldn't necessarily discuss with my students, but I knew okay they want to do this, they want to do A, but but A is not going to work. But let me try to get them the M to give them some of what they want from A. Right. And I think that helped me um, even just kind of learn the the skill of negotiation and the skill of the art of facilitation, the art of negotiation, and also learning how to build rapport and trust with people that are other than myself, that don't look like me, that don't think like me. Um, and, and, and that has helped me um, throughout my career because you know I've worked at corporate and I've worked in a corporate environment and I've had, you know, I've had uh, white females that were my supervisors. And you know, sometimes we do get um, tagged sometimes as being uh, aggressive versus being assertive because we have we are taught sometimes to acquiesce who we are and step back. Um, only sometimes they, they say you know to dim your light to allow the lights of others to shine. But sometimes you have to learn how to speak up for what you want. Because I now say we have not because we ask not, right? And so I think um, you know learning those those different skills and also challenging students. I I was challenging myself. And I was challenging myself to be the best self that I could be. And it was not always easy. But I think that the journey that I had as an starting as a student, uh, transitioning to an employee, and then also, you know, really dedicated to an alum, um, really helped me to navigate all of those challenges, but also to really hone in on my leadership skills um, and try to make the connection across the board. Great, great point. Great uh, nuggets. I like what you said about not being that yes person. That is very, um, you know, true in today's world. And it's not about being liked, but respected. And I like how you are encouraging individuals at an early age of understanding what that looks like. So, Ira, let's let's listen to you. What, based. Back to our question of, you know, people not understanding their leadership abilities and characteristics and understanding our culture are not being able to help us manifest that. What have you seen in, in your life and, uh, you know, serving as a head drum major at Jackson State University and where you are right now? Um, help us understand your viewpoint about it. Well, James, um, actually, I spend, I spend about 30 minutes every morning listening to Steve Harvey. And something that he says is something that I know that we wasn't taught in school. And that was dreaming. I think that dream is important. Education is important. But that gift that everyone has, and I think that's what you're speaking on when you said the leadership, we'd rather follow, you know, our culture doesn't put us in a position where we where we actually stand up for what we want. But I think that um, if you had an opportunity, you get an opportunity every day, you have a chance to take every day when you wake up. I think that you have to take advantage of those things. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna toot I'm not gonna toot Lori's horn, but I knew her dad and he was a very strong smiling happy man when I was in, in, in middle school and I, I saw that so those people were great leaders you know James you and I had an opportunity to be drum majors and even though we were hit drum majors we had an opportunity to be the head drum major and you know what was the dream I can tell you honestly that when I was a boy scout passing out the flyers at the football games and seeing Jackson State come in, I never saw myself as being one of those guys bringing, the, bringing that, that, that band in. I, I, I didn't dream that. That wasn't my dream. And so um, Dow Taylor seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself is why I'm in the position that I'm in. And that's because he saw that potential. And I think that we as um, leaders, or in leadership roles, or even as a mentor, it's our job to see those diamonds, like Lori said, before, they, before they're cut. Um, someone that knows that can see that, um, the potential in the, in the young people. Um, I, I, once again, I, 
I tell someone in a minute, if you have the will, I'll give you a job. If you have the will and that's what you want to do, I'll give you a job. There's not a whole lot that you can come in and pretty much discredit yourself of wanting to work uh, under me because I'm going to work with you. And so as, as, a, as a manager, um, as a, a mentor, a leader, a drum major, I'm still the drum major. I mean, I, every, every weekend, I, I love putting on the show. I tell my staff, we practice in Monday through Thursday for the weekend. And uh, my staff is bought into that. And the great thing about it is I, I have young entrepreneurs that work, work with me. Um, we sit down sometime and talk about business models. Uh, I have a number of them that want to do their own transportation business. Um, and I let them, I, I, we throw things at each other. But uh, James, I think the dreaming part is what a lot of our young folks don't get a chance to experience because that's that gift. That's that gift that, that so much is not discovered until way later in life. I know my gift. You know, I, when moving back to Jackson, I realized what my purpose was. And once you um, accept that purpose, understand your purpose and your calling, it's your gift. And I think we, we, as, we as a people, we have not had an opportunity to experience that enough. We hear from the pastors, you know, we hear from certain teachers and all that. But if we hear from a collective group of leaders that's not with a title, I think that um, it works out better. But um, I've, I've been known to be fair and firm. And I, I tell young folks all the time, if I know your parents, it's, it's even rougher on you because I'm going to tell it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sticker for telling. When you come in my building and your child works for me, no matter how old they are, I'm telling you. If they're doing something good, I'm telling it. If they're doing something bad, I'm telling it. And James, I got that from my mom, man. My mom was a telltale. And it helped me. So um, I, I think that it, her doing what she did for me helped me get where I am today. So guess what? I'll do it for other people to try to help them get where they're trying to go. Let, let, let me say this, man. You said, both of you guys said a mouthful, but I want to bring it uh, a good point. And that is, I, I think of the analogy of uh, a spider web. And in the spider web, you have these cores that extend arms that allow the spider web to expand. And it seemed like you two are that core that can expand the arms to another core that expand the arms and continuously expand this arm that allow this big moving uh, spider web to occur. And I like what you said, Ira, when you said, when every time you come across an individual, you encourage them to dream big and to be uh, purposeful thinking. And what type of impact that, Laura, you have of the alumni and, and the people that you encounter of continuously talk about those dreams or those thinking big or those leadership capabilities and expand in our community and our society to where it's supposed to be. So I thank you all for having those conversations, even from a, uh, you know, a broad or even that employee that you, in, in, you know, impact every day. Um, which brings me to another question. When you talk about empowerment, what empowerment means to both of you all? And you all see parents, you see their, the, the the parents' kids, it seemed like you guys have an array of touching so many people. How do you all empower those individuals? Laura, you want me to go? Yeah, please, please, yeah. James, and I have before, a... You, before you say that, Ira, we, we talk ahead. about different generations of how you empower because they think totally different. How would you empower somebody like myself versus somebody that are in college right now? Is there a difference, same mental, same strategy or what? 
James, first of all, every person is an individual. So you can't you can't use you can't use the same uh, template on every person. And the great thing about the toolbox that I have with with the experience that I've had actually being in a leadership role since Boy Scout. So we're talking about 10 and 11 years old um, directing things that you had to get your peers to do and follow you. So all that practice from 10 years old to 50 years old, I mean, there's a lot of experience in that. So you know you have to deal with everyone differently. So for instance, I have staff members that work with me that's 60 years old, and I have some that work with me as young as 17 years old. You have to use, you have to treat each one of them as an individual. Sadly to say, 80 employees, I have to deal with 80 different attitudes. I have to deal with 80 different ways of empowering these employees. And the good thing about it, James, is that um, what I have learned to do, uh, James, hold on one second. Yeah, we can hear you, but Jess can't see you, so you good. Yeah. The, the, the thing that I have learned to do is basically um, I, I go and look at the model of what they're trying to do, what, where we're trying to go with it, and teach them. And I focus on what they do great. The negative of what they don't do well is not what I'm going to spend the time on when it's, when it's game time. You remember what I said Monday through Thursday we're practicing? Well, James, it's the same thing. I'm not going to put an, em an employee that, that was struggling Monday through Thursday on something and put them on Friday and Saturday where, they're gonna, where they may fail because we're going to have more people coming in, more things that could happen. So I'm going to find that one good thing that he can do or those two good things that he can do. And that's what he's going to do. And we'll work on those things that he's not well and great at during the week of next week. So it's going to be an ongoing process that we're going to do where we're going to we're going to get that employee up to the up to the up to par. And then basically, if he wants more, we're going to give him more. But every one of my employees, you'll never know what they're not good at because it's not going to be seen because Monday through Thursday, that's when I'm watching them and we're 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 tedious and touching everything. It's kind of like the way we did when we were in the band. James, we go out on the field, the, 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 the people didn't see what we're going to do Saturday on Monday because we stayed, we stayed in closed doors. The dance committee was in, the, in that back room. We didn't bring nothing out until it was time. And so we cleaned it up, but you wouldn't get the model. And so I, I, used, I used some of the same things that we did so well, and I, I kind of put it into my toolbox and, and I use it on a regular basis with, with what I do with both my um, restaurant and limousine service. Lori, how do you empower individuals, young, old? I don't know if I can follow behind that one. That was, you know, that was, you know, I just brought it on home for me. I mean, <laughs> but, but I like something that you just said, I was about a toolbox, right? And I think uh, we all have, and, and you started by saying one thing, I, I listen to Steve Harvey every morning as well, the 30 minutes, the last 30 minutes of the show, and he's always giving you these nuggets, and he just breaks stuff down that makes you really think about you as an individual and how you live your life and the impact that you make from day to day, right? And he, um, and he just, he just, he inspires so many people, and he, he inspires me every day as well. Um, but I think, you know, you talked about the toolbox and I know uh, at various points in my life, I've had to um, define what, my, what was in my toolbox. And sometimes you have to, you know, take some stuff out. You have to leave some stuff in. You have to, you know, just throw stuff in there together and just kind of shake the box up and see what's gonna fall out. You know, you're like, yeah, I remember those little, I'm about to date myself, those little things that those are boxes that you just wind up and they will pop up, you know, little clowns don't pop up. Sometimes that's that's life, and that's like leadership. And I think, um, you know, you 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 mentioned about no two people are the same. But I, I remember, you know, I, I'm gonna take it back to like, and I talk about Miss Patterson. Miss um, Patterson was my advisor, 
And she was also the like SGA advisor, but she, I watched Ms. Patterson and I, I studied her uh, because she was the, she was like the consummate, like Southern Belle. And, and it didn't matter who you were, where you came from, whether you liked her or not. She was, if, if she was for you, she was for you. But she, she instilled in, in, in our, us as students, like the right thing to do. Like just always have, just always go in wanting to do the right thing. Um, and she taught us how to be, um, how to be uh, assertive, but in a very ladylike way, right? And I, and I just always remember when I, um, you know, there would be things that she would say, things that she would do. And, and at the time, you know, I thought that she was one of the meanest people in the world, but she was instilling so much in me and she was teaching me so much. When I became the advisor of Ms. Jackson State, I was advising and leading just like she was. And again, it was a cycle. You know, the, the three or four or five queens that I advised, you know, because I was trying to keep them ready. You know, it's like you talked about uh, getting ready for game day. Well, for me, every day that you wake up, when you have, when you wear the title of Miss Jackson State, and I used to tell them this all the time, again, the title does not belong to you. The title belongs to the university. It could be you or somebody else. You're leasing this for a year. Now it's up to you what you're going to do with it. It's up to you what you're going to do with it. And so I would strive and, and try to empower, you know, the young ladies or the students to be the best that you can be. And how do you do it? You have to bring them in. And, and I would try to, you know, find out, like Iris said, what they were good at. And there were, there were a lot of times there were students that they were, they were first generation college students. They had never been in any type of group. They never felt like they belonged to anything. Those were the students that I targeted. Those were the students that I pushed out front. When, when, when a lot of times when other students say, "Hey, I, I raise my hand, I want to do this," I said, "Well, well let me let me ask uh, let me ask Mary what she think," and, and or I would go and pull them in by giving them a task to assist me to do things. Then they felt empowered. They felt like they they belonged to something. And when you you pull them in and you give them that confidence. And they, and you, you start, uh, well, you, well, you don't give them the confidence, but you kind of give them the resources and you pumping them up. So they become confident themselves. And it takes, it takes, takes a, a minute, but you, you, it's like you are, it's like planting a, planting a, planting a flowers. You know, you plant the seed, you got the water, you got to nurture it. And then eventually, you know, you're going to see the little bud growing in it. It's going to turn into something beautiful. And I saw that happen with so many of my students because um, they, they were given an opportunity. You know, I always said that best, you know, you, you know, you he'll hire anybody. He'll hire you, but you you gotta do the work to keep your job. And that was the same thing with me as student leaders. Um, there was a place for everybody. And if, if and, and for those students that I saw that needed that little extra push, those are the ones that I would target because we all we all know those high performers, right? They they're gonna just be high performers regardless of whatever's gonna happen. But I wanted to bring the other students along with them so that they know and they knew that they mattered. And then they also knew that somebody cared about them. And so I wanted to empower them so that eventually they would be, they will feel empowered to lead. And that's how, and when I was, when I started seeing them break out of the shell um, and they start becoming, they start becoming more vocal. Sometimes it would just be the way that they dressed. Sometimes it'll be the way that they care at themselves. Sometimes it'll be um, the way that if it was a young lady who had never in her life, and I had a young lady and she, she ended up winning Miss Jackson State. She had never been in a pageant day in her life. And I remember her finding, finding me on campus. She said, they told me that if I ever wanted to be Miss Jackson State, I need to come talk to you. And I said, no, who told you that story? But she, she was in this pageant and she had never been a pageant a day in her life, but she felt empowered. And I said, well, this is what you need to do to get prepared. That's what she did. She was in two or three pageants. Then she, she wanted to run for Miss Jackson State and she won. But it was also just giving her that support because she had never had that. So I think I'm empowering them um, to lead from the front and the back and then also kind of wrapping around the sides of, um, of support. But I, I would typically go in for those that may not, like Ira said, you know, the ones that are not the strongest you know we always talk about the weakest link but I always think that there's there's it's not the weakest link but it just may be that you know maybe the link in the chain that just need to be just need to be right. you know polish just a little bit more you know what um you guys have served in a 
a great capacity for um, not only Jackson State, HBCU, um, colleges around the, the, the nation here. What, and there are several organizations that are on campuses. And how, what, how do you, as you know, Ms. JSU, teach or we talk about empower, in your case, what is the leave behind? How can Miss JSU, Miss, you know, TSU, Miss anybody leave behind and not thinking about the crown, uh, picking up the crown and it's this prestigious thing and I'm just walking around, you know, what are some of the duties that that individual must do in order to be impactful of the student body. And then this, and, and I'm gonna make this disclaimer here. I'm about to get into some JSU stuff. So I apologize because I know this is seen around the nation, but I am going to just a few minutes because I'm gonna ask Ara a JSU specific question as well. But this is JSU, Miss, Miss JSU wearing the crown, being impactful, with still having the prestigious behind you, uh, but Talk to me, Lori. How how can one who wears the crown still be impactful? So I will say this, and this is a, like a running a running joke that I used to say when I was with Jackson State. I used to soar with the eagles in the daytime, and I used to hang with the plaza rats at night. So I was the people's queen. I mean, I was just I, you know I never changed. I never I never. You have to just be authentic. Right. And I think that when people see the um, they, they feel, you know, I think Maya Angelou is the one who said people may not ever remember what you say, but they always make remember how you make them feel. Um, and, and I would, you know, I, I I used to sit on the plaza sometimes with, you know, and, and talk to the people and they'd be sitting on one side because they'd be doing some illegal stuff over there. But, you know, I would, you know, we would be talking across, you know, talking back and forth across the plaza. But but um, but I but, you know, for me, it was just. Uh, being being true to myself and being genuine um being just having that being just being just authentic um and i will tell you that i being miss jackson state was something a dream i already mentioned dream a dream of mine um since i was five years old and i remember um and i, I don't remember at the time who the queen was but i remember going to the game and i would always see this young lady walking around the field just just bright shiny crown and um we would sit uh, it was like everybody, you know, back in the day, all the families got together. And they would go to the games and stuff. You know, that's when you say night games. And I would always tell my mom, "Mama, that's gonna be me. You know, I'm gonna be the lady with the crown." And she's like, "Baby, be whatever you want to be." And so, you know, she would let me, go, you know, wear these crowns to the games. But um, that was a life lifelong dream of mine was to be Miss Jackson State. I did not know the responsibility that came along with the title. Mm -hmm. I did not know the impact. Um, not until I met Melita Singleton, Melita Dixon Singleton. Uh, Melita's younger sister, Terika, and I went to elementary, uh, junior high, and also high school together. And that's when I first met Melita. Um, I also later learned when I was in high school that my English communications teacher, Vivian Healy Dotson, was Miss Jackson State College 1965-66. And she was married to my mother's first cousin. She was always a mentor of mine, but I did not know that was something real special about her, right? And I remember they just they just exuded uh, style, elegant, elegant, grace, poise, um, just uh, leadership in so many so many ways. And I think for me, um, again, it's what I talked about earlier about you know one of the pat one of my passions is working with young women and young women of color and helping them to realize their potential and then achieving their dreams or their goals, whatever it could be. However, I can be instrumental in helping you get there. Because one thing I do know is that we have to live as we climb. I had people to help me. And I know that there are other people out there that do not have the same type of help, that do not have the same type of access or resources that I have and that I had. And so I feel it's incumbent upon me as a black woman today, as a professional black woman, um, to lift as I climb, as, as I move, I move other people are with me, right? You, and you, so- You know what, Lori, I'm gonna, 
I'm going to interrupt you because something just dawned on me that I want you to speak upon. Okay. And that is surrounding uh, Ms. Formal, uh, Ms. Ms. USA, who we speak about the responsibility mm. uh, that you were talking about and continuing that elegance and that poise as a Black woman. And unfortunately, she lost her life in suicide. How uh, are you being able to probably utilizing that platform as a Miss JSU of speaking on suicide prevention and, uh, you know, being able to uh, talk to these women who wear the crown and also giving back in that particular category? Well, well, I think what people also have to realize is that, yes, you may be, you know, Miss Jackson State, you may be, you know, X, Y, and Z, but you are still a student. And you are still a human being and you still have feelings and you still experience the good, the bad and ugly of life. And I think um, I, I have a master's degree in counseling and it, and it did help me when I started working in student affairs because um, I am not a licensed counselor. I did not do the license track. I did the community non-school track. Um, but, but my training in counseling helped me work with some of these students that were dealing with so many issues. One, was you know mental health mental health ill and and you know and and there were some students who um who were dealing with some 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 really serious challenges that if if i had not taken the time just to sit down and talk to them it could have gone the other way right and i think having a platform of uh being a um being one of the two top student leaders um it was incumbent upon me uh, you know, to reach back and have conversations with other young women on campus about, you know, what's going on in your world. You know, there may they may have been experiencing things that I knew nothing about, and vice versa. But I also wanted to hear because I think sometimes when we sit down and we give somebody an ear, and you just take the time to listen, um, you just never know the impact that listening can help um, and the difference that, that it will make, and um, maybe offering. Um, some some resources or access to resources that are on campus because you know we had a counseling center and the counseling center was birthed out of a, a very um, tragedy that happened on campus with uh, Latasha Norman and what happened off campus but she was a student right and mm -hmm. so as a result of that um, came you know the, the topic of domestic violence and it was happening so much on our campus but nobody wanted to talk about it. Interesting. When, when I was the um, over programming for uh, SGA and for the university, we would, and, and I got this from Ms. Patterson as well, you know, I, I owe a lot to Ms. Patterson. You know, we started touching on subjects that were very prevalent along among college campuses, but nobody wanted to talk about, like uh, date rape, uh, domestic violence. You know, we would bring um, homosexuality. And, 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 and the thing about it is, these are not taboo subjects. To some people, it may have been. But it was alive and well on our campus, and we and, and what we needed to do was create a safe space for our students to feel comfortable, right? Right to be able to uh, to navigate those those spaces and those journeys and that pathway, so that they themselves felt safe. And I think again, I go back to what I was saying. It was incumbent upon me, as Miss Jackson State, as a student leader, even now as an alumni, alumni queen, um, to reach back. And to uh, to work with our young ladies, um, and to just kind of see because you know some of the some of the challenges you know everything is kind of very cyclical. Um, it, it may be a different year, but the problems and some of the issues are still the same. And I think that also exposing them to um, to positive networks. You know, I know um, I saw a couple of people here. I saw Gwen Dungee, and I saw Jacqueline Faulkner here. And, and I know that they themselves in their own respective areas, you know, have been um, positive. They were positive role models, even for me when I was on campus, but even having those type of networks and knowing that you have access to those type of networks and those people that are, that are not untouchable, it will help you um, in the long run and, and, and try to, um, I guess, help you sometimes navigate those challenges because if you, you run into somebody who feels like they are alone, but if I know that I can pick up the phone or go to the go to the dorm room, if I go to Gwen's dorm room or Jackie's dorm room, or go to Lori's dorm room, if I'm having a problem and I just want to ask a question, how do I navigate this problem? How do I navigate the situation? But just knowing that I have that person 
um, and then have that resource there, I think will we'll make all the difference in the world. Well, uh, to your point, as an undergrad, you will go through several challenges in life, uh, and you have those individuals, uh, mentors that will allow you to continue uh, your journey. And I think it's very imperative for us to go against the grain of what the culture is, is telling us that it is, you know, they want to see our leadership lie dormant, but we got to wake that thing up in, 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 at an early age that will only benefit us uh, later on through our journey in life and be purposeful and gift, gifted in life. Now, I'm going to pivot just a, a, a little because I think a lot of people want to hear this answer from the godfather of drum majors. And once again, Lori, <laughs> I know that was a sensitive, uh, uh, you know, question and everything, but you answered it beautifully because, you know, suicide is, it's, uh, is definitely one of those things that we don't want to talk about, but it's going on, but you did a great job of, uh, Thank you. of, of commenting on that. So let's pivot a little because a lot of, man, and I hate to say this Jacksonian because we have a lot of people nationwide that's listening to this. So if you guys could just bear with me, because I know a lot of people uh, through this question in and want to hear from the Godfather himself. And that is, as we talk about great drum majors, I cannot distinguish a great drum major based upon showmanship. And there have been a lot of showmanship going on in Jackson State, but the one who blazed the trail were always those individuals that left a phenomenal leadership thing that at Jackson State. Mr. Drum Major, Mr. Head Drum Major himself, can you please <laughs> differentiate the showmanship versus the leadership from the drum majors at Jackson State University. We're only gonna to touch upon this because I know a lot of people wanted to ask you this. And how does that affect, you know, uh, leaving Jackson State and continuing in those transferable skills as a leader, uh, as a Jackson State drum major? So showmanship versus leadership, what have you seen since you have, you know, you godfather, the man that I looked up at, versus what's going on right now. Well, James, um, let's start with this. I can remember, I can remember when you was in high school and you were in Bel Air and I think we worked on the mace in my front yard. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Yep. Okay. So that was showmanship. Showing you how to twirl that mace. Um, and no, everybody couldn't twirl a mace, but we could teach everyone how to twirl a mace if they needed to do that as part of the routine. Um, James, James, I've never been the guy that wanted to do all the dancing. I, I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't want to do that. Um, I actually had difficulties dancing, um, learning routines. I was part of the dance committee, which was a blessing in disguise because. That gave me two, three days of, of putting something together before the band even got a chance to see it. I, I spent many, many Sundays with, with Dow Taylor and Dr. Vivian Taylor at their home waiting on Spook and Dara to show up for the session, which I'll sit there with him and his wife for two hours uh, doing VHS uh, tapes where we rewinding um, the BET. Um, I can't even remember what the what the the segment was that was on during that time where he would record all the videos and we would go back and look at them and try to pull a dance off of it. But that was the showmanship part of it. Um, but James, I, personally, I was a head drum major with a curfew. I didn't stay on campus. I had a father, I stayed at home and hit my curfew was 12 o'clock. So I was the guy that, um, would ease away from a crowd of people if they stand around talking so I can make it home. During that time, we didn't have cell phones. So right. James, it was no going to the pay phone to call home and say, you're going to be late. So I got my butt on down <laughs> from West Jackson to Jackson to get on home to North Jackson. Um, James, that JSU versus life, I think that uh, JSU put us in a lot of practice on the things that we were gonna do in life. 
Um, I will say this, I didn't have the fun that most people probably did while they were in college. And the reason why is because I took it upon myself as a freshman when I tried out for drum major and, and I made my freshman year as a drum major and I knew I was coming back the next, the next year to be one of the three drum majors. Um, Dal Taylor asked all three of us, that would be Spook, um, the late Daryl Shaw and myself. Um, if I chose this person over you, how would that make you feel? If I chose this person over you, how would that make you feel? And what was so cool, Daryl Shaw said, I don't care who you pick over me. I just want to be a drum major. <laughs> and so when it came to me, he asked me about uh, if he was to choose Spook over me. And I just, I was honest. I said, um, I'm just going to work harder to show you that you picked the wrong person. And so I worked my butt off. You know, James, I came to practice on time. And, you know, that saying, uh, being early is on time and being on time is late. You know, I mean, I was early every day at practice. Um, PT, I was early. You know, as, as a person that had curfew and had to get home, sometimes not even getting a ride home, um, getting a ride to school, I was that guy. So um, practicing before the game is instilled in me. And I, I kind of instilled it into my, my own lifestyle. You know, Dow Taylor said, you guys are not going to want to hang out with the, with the band members because they're not going to listen to you in practice if you've been drinking with them all night. So, James, I chose not to drink and I chose not to hang out with them. The other reason why I had to be at home. So I didn't have that curve, that, that carefree to hang out on campus all night. Um, but I also instilled it into my lifestyle now with, and that's not fraternizing with my employees. You know, so it's, it's, that's an easy one. The other thing is I, I, I had a, um, an area director, Andrea D. She explained to me when I first became a general manager, she said, Ira, she said, let me give you some rules to, to follow. She said, you could be the last to come to a party, but be the first to leave. And I was like, hmm. She's like, that's fine. It's fine to come to a, a gathering, but be the last to come and the first to leave. She said, that way, nothing, nothing can be associated with you. And so those leaders that I followed and those things that they instilled in me, it's kind of like what Lori said about her mentors, they, you instill those things, and those practices, because you're watching those individuals and how good they're doing their job. And you see so much good in them that you, you actually imitate and pick up on the things that they're doing because it works. It impressed you um, and it, you instill it in you. And at the end of the day, you know, James, I am not one to judge. You know, Eric Thomas, is another motivation speaker that I listen to, uh, E.T., the, the hip hop preacher. And he says it all the time. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't knock his partners that he grew up with on the things that they do. And James, I'm the same way. You've been knowing me for probably over, James, you've been knowing me uh, for it over did. 30 plus years. Right. And so, yeah, and so, you know, I don't knock anyone for what they do and what they want to do, you know, because. I have my road, my path, and, and I know where I want to go. And, you know, I don't, I don't infringe in anybody's business. I, I let everybody do, do their thing. When I, now, if you up under my wing, you know I'm going to say something. You know, I, I won't be silent, especially if I know, because now or with a lot of the young people now, I call myself an accountability coach because I expect them to tell me what they want to do and they need to have someone to hold them accountable. So I do it with my son, my nephews, and I got a ton of nephews and kids now since I'm so much older now, but I hold them accountable and I make them tell me what they're trying to do. So that way I can hold them accountable. Well, you heard it from the one and only, the man who have uh, trailed the blaze of uh, what we see right now. Uh, which brings me to another point of uh, alumni, Lori, as well as Ira. Let's speak on this real quickly, and then we can go ahead and, and close out for, for tonight. But 
the numbers were very um, impressive this year of attendance, but we can be high in attendance and low in some in another area. And that's alumni. Um, if not, if I'm not mistaken, Lori was giving me some numbers earlier that you know, sixty thousand fans for uh, homecoming and forty six for the celebration bowl, but unfortunately, only fifty six hundred paid national alumni, and twelve of them. 12 of, 1,200 of them are recent grad that gets their first year free. So what is that telling us from the support, a leadership support, um, leaving undergrad, going from undergrad to more of a graduate uh, lifestyle and not giving back, not um, being engaged, being empowered, and people can be leaders by giving back to their own alumni. But I thought that was very disturbing to hear the amount of people that attend the games, but the amount of people that don't support the institution that gave them the degree. So Lori and Ira, can y'all speak on that from a leadership standpoint? What does that mean for my alumni? And um, moving forward, how can we empower them to do a better job in, in this category? Well, I will, I will say this. So um, if you can see my background here, um, I am currently running for second vice president of the National Alumni Association. And the main responsibility of the second VP is to focus on membership. And, and James, you, you talked about it. And, and you know, as we were talking before we started, um, there were almost 60,000 people at the homecoming game, 2021 homecoming game. The SWAC championship, we had about 50, I'm going to say 56, 56,000 or something. And then for the Celebration Bowl in Atlanta, it was about 46,000 people. And I'm going to say, let's say maybe 30,000 were GSU followers. But, but our National Alumni Association, we, we can only say that we have 5,600 paid members. And again, that's a disconnect somewhere. You know, um, we had two of the three games that are played in Jackson, and yet still, we packed the stadium but we can't pack our alumni association. You know, um, at, we, we've got to start building a pipeline of leaders, young leaders. We've got to start engaging, um, recruiting our young alums, our recent graduates, bring them to the table. They've got to see the value. They've got to see the value in, in why they should give back, why they should be an active paid alumnus. Um, you know, a lot of our students are graduating um, in areas like, you know, accounting and mass communications and marketing and, you know, whatever, you know, engineering, whatever. And they, they're graduating and graduating with no jobs. Yet and still, we have some very notable alums across the country that are doing some wonderful things and some impactful things in those specific areas. Why is there a disconnect? You know, we, we've got to start, um, and still in our students, you know, when we were in school, I think it was called like University 101, because I remember uh, Dr. Liddell was my uh, professor, you know, we really had a class because it was my class in the fall, but you know, you had that one-on-one -on -one class, you had to learn how, you know, Jackson Fair, Jackson Deer, you know, talked about Jackson, you learned the history. And a lot of that stuff has been uh, carved out of um, the curriculum. And I think that that's incumbent upon us, even as alums, but, um, but I think th there, is a, there is a huge disconnect um, and we've got to see how to bridge the gap. And that's one of the things I want to focus on um, if I'm elected a second VP is um, cleaning up our data, making sure that we have clean data and also bringing our young alums and reaching graduates to the table. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, really push other people to our seasoned, our seasoned alums to the side, but we've got to bridge the gap because we've got to start bringing these other people to the table. Our young people, they, they, got, to, they got to see us being visible. Right. And they need to know that we're valuable. And most important, they need to know that we're valuable. And so it's even like bringing, up, re, you know, bringing back a perch package. Like, you know, I was telling you all, you know, we travel, we're staying at a Marriott property, a Hilton property. Why are we not leveraging that, that network and getting discounts? We fly when we go to different places. Why are we not leveraging those partnerships? When you fly somewhere, you're probably gonna rent a car. Why are we not leveraging those type of partnerships? And those are the type of things that we've got to start building up on. You know, Jack State is on fire right now. So we got to strike, you know, while the fire is hot. We got we got to strike. But, but I think that um, 
looking at those numbers that we have, like I said, 60,000 people at homecoming game and only 5,600 people in alumni association are paid. Just think about the impact that we could have if every one of those people in our alumni association brought at least one, in act, just one, one in active person to and encourage them to pay their dues. We could achieve the goal of membership of having 10,000 paid people in our National Alumni Association by the end of 2022. It's achievable, right? And then also, um, you know, making, you know, we've got to meet people where they are and then also increasing our footprint in the digital age and, and being, being more uh, technologically savvy. Um, you know, everybody sitting at a football game with a cell phone. You know, why don't we use, you know, text, you know, text something like alum to, you know, 1877 too or something like that and take them to a form so you can get their information. And that's how you have to engage them. You, again, it, we talked about from the beginning, you know, making people, making people feel like they belong to something, um, but also so they can see the value. Um, I, I just think that we have, you know, you and Ira and so many other people before us and, and even some of the students now, you know, they're looking for, okay, there's somebody who may be going to, uh, want, wanting to go into the hospitality industry. Do they know how to connect with Ira? We need, we need to connect them. We need to bridge that gap, you know? Um, and, and I think it starts with, I mean, he's right there in Jackson, you know, and it's like, you know, they may see him a homecoming, but it's like, do you really know what he does? Do you know the impact that he has and the, and the impact and the footprint that he has in the hospitality industry um, and how he can help you, you know, achieve, achieve your, your goals of entrepreneurship, get you started, right? So I think um, all, all of those things are very important. And for me, it is stressing um, making sure that people know the value and give back. I, I, I would, I'm gonna say this and I, I'll, I'll move on, but um, our um, APR, um, our alumni giving rate, it, it has been very low. Uh, we, we, we took it from like 2.4 to like 4.8. I think we're like right about 9 point something, 9, 9 point eight, which is great. We've made some notable strides. And I think President Hudson now wants to move to um, 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 going to like getting, going to 11% next year, which I think we can all do it, but we don't need to just give at one time a year day of giving. I think we just need, we need to make sure that we're encouraging people to give year round, but give in different ways. It's not always financial. It can be other ways as well, but I think it also starts, um, you know, as, as an undergraduate student. Go ahead, Ira. Well, James, you know, I don't, when Laura was talking about this earlier, you know, I don't, I don't have a whole lot on this. I am back a student again. Um, after leaving Jackson State over 30 years, I'm back in school, finishing up, um, taking, uh, doing one of mom's gifts. She asked me to finish what I started. So um, I'm about one year out. So next year I'll be graduating from Jackson State with a bachelor's in interdisciplinary study. Um, as far as a giver, I think that Laura is right on point. Um, we just have to have ways of doing it. Also, we have to be educated, make sure everybody, um, the, especially when she was speaking about the updated list, I think all that's important. I mean, because um, if they don't know how to get in contact with you, because you got to think about it, a lot of the students, uh, once they leave Jackson State, they you know, venture out and go find other jobs. Um, may move from the home address that they had, um, stayed in Jackson so long where they found a per permanent residency in Jackson to kind of lower that uh, out of state fee, started living in Jackson. I mean, so, you know, they're gone. So I think she she's hit a lot of things on, on, on point. And uh, Laura, I, I wish you luck. I mean, um, I will be voting, so, um, <laughs> And Thank I wish you. you luck on that. Yes, <laughs> you, you, you threw a lot of stuff at James and I before we got started on this. And I um, was telling my fiance how, how um, I was really overwhelmed to know that this is my first time getting a chance to, to really just listen to you and talk to you. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm for whatever we got to do to do this. And I, I, I would do my part. I say that um, I'm here locally. I live in I live in Clinton, but I, I have a restaurant in Flowood, and mm -hmm. I'm for whatever you want to do. And we need your fiance to come on, tell her, you know, 
I need her. Yeah. I need her too. So okay. All right. I will let. I will let Hope know. <laughs> she, she's one of my. She's one. She's one of my babies too. Gotcha. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So guys, I really thank you all for uh, blessing us um, on J Dub's corner. What a dynamic, uh, phenomenal uh, discussion. Um, true leaders are not who control, but rather serve. And you guys are serving at a capacity at a high level. So I thank you all. Uh, leaders are born, and um, you know the culture tells us that uh, you cannot discover your leadership and it's it has to remain dormant uh, until you die but today we're going to stop that we're going to say uh, challenge yourself to manifest your leadership within and become purposeful be a purposeful living uh, living individual and even if it becomes these two individuals that have served in a capacity from an undergrad standpoint and they transition or transfer their skills, into what they're doing right now, but they're still blessing others. They're still hiring people. Um, you know, they're still reaching out. They're still mentoring, and that's what it's all about. Leadership does not stop at Miss JSU nor head drum major. It is forever instilled in us. So I thank you all for for uh, your pearls. I thank you all for the encouragement. Continue doing what you're doing, uh, Lori. You got a, a campaign going, so we're going to support you, Ira. Continue. Um, you know, you're about to graduate, bachelor's degree, man. We thank you for going back and reaching back and doing what you got to do. And uh, we're looking forward to some more discussions in the future. So thank you all. Hats off. And I appreciate you all. Much love. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. See you, Lord. See you, Ira. Hey, Ira. <laughs> <laughs> y'all be good, man. Thank you all. All right.